All right. Well, I think we can get started here. Thanks all for joining. We'll admit others uh, as needed. Um, so again, thanks for coming. We, um, my name is Shannon Henris, and I'm here with the healthcare justice team with Georgetown ACLU. Um, and we have a great discussion in honor of World Health Day earlier this week. Um, so we're lucky enough to be joined by Dr. Arno from DC Health Office of Health Equity and Professor Cannon from our own Health Justice Alliance. Um, and to get started, um, they're just both gonna introduce themselves and their position, their organization. Um, so maybe we can start with um, Dr. Arno, if you wanna start with your introduction and tell us a little sure. about yourself. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to uh, have been invited uh, to chat with all of you today. Um, health equity is my passion. Um, I'm the director of the Office for Health Equity at DC Health. Uh, prior to that, I um, worked uh, in, in fact, my largest stint before now was in Louisville, Kentucky as the director of the Center for Health Equity. I also did a short stint in um, Kansas City, Missouri. Um, similar work, um, but it's very excited to be in the nation's capital and to doing the work here with all these great universities around. So that's me. Hi everyone, um, and, and a huge welcome on behalf of the law school to Dr. Arno. Um, we're so thrilled to have you with us today. Um, my name is Yael Cannon and I'm a professor um, here at Georgetown Law and the director of the Health Justice Alliance Law Clinic. Um, and just to give you just a minute of quick background on the work we do um, in the Health Justice Alliance, because I'm excited to build some connections with Dr. Arno and all of you around that today. Um, our, um, our program is um, a medical legal partnership between the law school and the medical school, where we work together to pursue health equity in DC by addressing um, social determinants of health through legal advocacy. So thinking about how um, legal advocacy in areas like housing, um, Medicaid coverage, access to um, food stamps and other benefits um, can address things like housing security and food security um, that are drivers of, of um, health disparities and, and hopefully through our lens drivers of health equity in, um, in Washington, DC. So um, I'm thrilled to be able to have this conversation today um, with Dr. Arno and in partnership with the ACLU here at Georgetown Law, which is doing really, really important work around a lot of um, issues of, of equity and, and um, through this special um, healthcare justice group with a, a special focus on these issues. Um, so to dive in, Dr. Arno, um, we're, we're really interested um, in talking with you today um, about issues of health equity in DC through a broader lens, as well as um, through the lens of the pandemic and particularly around vaccine access. Um, but to give us a little bit of background, um, I've always been so struck by just the um, huge disparities, um, even in, in things as important as, as life expectancy, just right within our fairly small diamond of, of Washington, DC. So can you talk a little bit about before the pandemic, um, what were some of the greatest barriers to health equity um, in DC's communities? Well, um, thank you so much for that great starter question. Um, we published the inaugural health equity report for the District of Columbia in February 2019. And just about a year after that, uh, the pandemic hit. So um, what is unusual about the health equity report, um, at the first of its kind in DC, I built uh, one of those already in Louisville, Kentucky. But it really um, goes beyond the traditional notions of, of health disparities. And it really talks about um, framing and reframing the question of what drives health. So it really talks about what we set up here in the district. And that's the kind of a new lens is the idea that what we have are nine key drivers of health in the district. And, um, and it's, it talks about, it's really is based on the evidence base that has been developed I would say from 2008 coming forward, um, and a lot has actually happened in the last 10 years uh, from 2010 and going forward as well. So it talks about really the frame is that 80% of what drives a population's health has nothing to do with healthcare or genes or anything like that. So the other 80%, which are really, uh, so 20% is, is healthcare, health insurance, and the things that we always like to talk about, and especially, post the Affordable Care Act, 
we really have to think about how all of that works. So the nine key drivers of health are actually um, things like uh, housing. Uh, you mentioned them before. Um, housing, education, um, employment, income, outdoor environment, um, community safety, all of those good things and how all of those things come together and drive our opportunities for health. So you also mentioned life expectancy at birth. What we did that was unique for the district um, prior to the release of the health act report, the district primarily talked about what happened in different wards. And so everybody would just say, Word seven and word eight, and everybody would make grand assumptions about what that meant, who lived there and what the outcomes were. Um, there was little idea that health inequities across the entire District of Columbia. What was unique in the way we've done the work is to drill down to a more granular, what we call 51 statistical neighborhoods. And so the, the, the 51 neighborhoods they are statistical, so they're not what people would call these are where, this is where we live, this is not Georgetown and you know the, the traditional boundaries of Georgetown. It's, it's really very much tied to census tract. So that's why they're, they're, they're technically proximal neighborhood groups, but all that's technical. So really, but what we see ultimately in the end, when we map all of those nine key drivers, including access to health insurance, what we see is the same pattern repeating over and over again. And overall, we have a 21 year difference in life expectancy at birth across the district. And the health equity report, which I would re recommend to all of you if you haven't seen it, is that those patterns repeat across every single one of the 51 statistical neighborhoods. And if you stack them with the ones with the longest life expectancy, which are really nearly 90 years, and you kind of go down 90.9, you know, whatever, 90.8, all the way down to the last one at the, with the shortest life expectancy, it's less than 70 years. And that's why we get to the 21, 21 year difference in life expectancy. But it's not just that. If you also were to look across the board in terms of those nine key drivers and you put some statistic across the board, you're almost seeing, and then you color the first uh, 10 in green, you'll see almost bingo, 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 bingo across the board. And then when you look at the flip side on the bottom and you, and you count the ones that have the worst outcomes, you're seeing red, red, red across the board. And in between, you have a spattering of everything else. So what that is saying is not simply do we have a rich, poor kind of dichotomy, we have a very in, in, you know, ingrained levels of life expectancy that goes along with quality of life, that goes along with what I call opportunities for help. And that is really telling us that we're not all, you know, we all have some modicum or allotment of quality of life and opportunities for health across the district. And, and that's basically the framework. So that's, that's my quick introduction. Thank you so much, Dr. Arno. And um, those, those are many of the same challenges that we see facing um, many of the low-income families, families of color um, in, in Washington, D.C., um, who um, our medical partners are screening for um, health-harming legal needs and seeing that these same issues of injustice really are intersecting so deeply with the health disparities um, that you described. And so um, we're grateful that your work um, is looking through this holistic lens, recognizing kind of the role of um, you know, of, of social conditions and these types of opportunities or lack of opportunities um, in the way they impact health. Um, it really helps us think as lawyers about how we might be able to make a difference, which is something we'll talk about in a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but we wanted to actually shift now to talking about the pandemic. Um, and um, there's there's been a lot of discussion in our city about how the pandemic has both spotlighted and exacerbated exacerbated some of the existing health disparities. And actually that's a national trend as well. Mm -hmm. um, you see, we've really seen huge disparities around infection rates um, of COVID, hospitalizations, ICU rates, and deaths in our city. Mm -hmm. um, we're interested in hearing from you. Um, how has the pandemic changed DC Health's strategy to address health inequity? 
Has it underscored or shifted your existing priorities? Well, it clearly over the last year, the only priority almost was the pandemic. I mean, there, we had no other option but to focus on that. So it's it's almost it was like it's a catch twenty two. Um, we use the fifty one statistical neighborhoods to actually map the pandemic. Uh, we use it in everything that we do. We were able to observe, unlike what we would have normally have seen, and we still publish it because people still, no matter what you tell them, they say, what happened in Ward 7 and Ward 8? What we could tell by mapping the pandemic, both in terms of all of those things that you mentioned, was you can see differing outcomes. So I, I mentioned differential opportunities for health in the district. We also had differential impacts in terms of infections, in terms of recovery, in terms of death. And so we are able to see a different pattern of where the infections were spreading the fastest. So we had a 16th street corridor um, kind of look. And so you could see it kind of uh, slinking up there. If we were only to do it on a ward basis, you would just see big numbers and you would try to figure out, you'd think it was the whole of ward four. But what we were also seeing was higher rates of recovery in the, uh, the western part of Ward 4, where we were seeing the highest rates of infection. And then, even though it started off slower, we were seeing higher rates of death down in, in especially in the extreme, in wards, Ward 7 and Ward 8 in particular. And so we could see a very dynamic changes related to all of those things. And if, if I were to show you those maps of, you know, we, we say in the district that 98% of folks have health insurance. But we still have major pockets in the city where people where health insurance is down to like 85%. And that in fact is up there in the north, more on the northeast side, but it's where we have a concentration of, of, his, of a Hispanic population. And that partly maps where we saw some of it. So we've had a dynamic change in terms of both how it impacted different races, different ethnicities, different ages, et cetera, et cetera. And so that is really what we were able to observe. Now, in terms of responding to the pandemic, and I know that's where you're gonna go next, but it has also had an impact on who was, I think awareness is, has been different across different populations. And one could talk about health literacy and what does that mean? And in fact, we are now working on a grant that will talk about health literacy and how important that could be. And we don't, even though we have these where we live patterns, so the patterns of where we live is actually uh, sitting on top of, and I didn't talk about that at the beginning, we're sitting on top of the old geography of, uh, of, um, of redlining, et cetera. So we are a highly segregated city, one of the most segregated in the US. In fact, our racial dissimilarity index is something like 70%. 70% of us would have to move if we wanted to have an equal distribution by a race across the city. And so it's almost a mirror image of where white better off people live versus black not so well off people live versus the Hispanics, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's really, and so responding to those communities and figuring out what was really going on and you know, engaging all of them, we've had to have and develop and divide Oh, you muted, Dr. Arno. I don't know how that happened. Oops, I don't know how long that was going on for. Oh, just the last few seconds. Okay, so yes, so what I was saying, with all of that dynamic, where people live, we all live in different parts of the city, but we're not necessarily, we, we work in different parts of the city. So it's, it's a fairly small place, and most of us live and work here, but we see that we see the um, the infection rates and the deaths, et cetera, uh, tracking with where people live, not necessarily with where they were. But it is also closely associated with folks who are able to uh, stay at home and shelter in place and work from home versus those who um, that we call essential workers who have had to be out there. Uh, and then, of course, we've had a lot of people who have lost employment altogether with the impact that that has had. Thank you so much, Dr. Arno. That um, definitely reflects a lot of what um, we've been 
seeing with the challenges facing um, our client population and um, you know the the economic impacts um, that go hand in hand with the health impacts. Um, and I just wanted to note that I'm I'm really glad you mentioned the issue of redlining and um, you know for our our law students. Um, one of the reasons that we use the term health justice to describe our work is because it really forces us, that word justice really forces us to think about the role of law and policy um, mm -hmm. within driving disparities and the opportunity to use law and policy to mitigate them, remediate them, and hopefully prevent them. Um, but, you know, when you mention redlining and this history of very, you know, purposeful discrimination and segregation and the deep history of, of structural racism, you know, some of the things that you're talking about, they were intentional, you know, and, um, and law and policy was there to facilitate um, these, these separations and these differences. Um, and now we're seeing the, the you know, multi-generational impacts um, of, of really horrible law and policy. And, you know, we can think about our role as lawyers and all of you as aspiring lawyers um, in, in what we can do um, to change law and policy um, and support the work of people like Dr. Arner to address those. So thank you for, you know, for, for making that connection for us. Um, I wanted to, um, to ask you about um, vaccine distribution in DC and we're gonna talk about that um, for the next little while. Um, I know our students are really, you know, interested and in, in people around the city and the country are kind of watching equity issues closely around the vaccine rollout. And, you know, there's been a fair amount of media coverage in DC about um, sort of inequities, especially um, early on um, as the vaccine distribution kicked off. So I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. What have been some of the greatest challenges in planning for and implementing equitable vaccine distribution in DC? Well, um... And I, I think you're you're right. I just wanted to. There's something that um, I should have kind of framed some of my conversation earlier. I didn't mention it, and now we'll get right into the vaccine uh, thing. Um, whenever I speak about health equity, I usually sort of go through a health equity, what I call a health equity 101, and that really frames whoever I speak to. I, I typically start with this notion that, and I think I did mention that health is more than health care. Health inequities are neither natural nor inevitable. Your zip code may be more important your, than your genetic code for health. The choices we make are shaped by the choices we have. Structural racism acts as a force in the distribution of opportunities for health, and therefore all policy is health policy. So where does that leave us in terms of how are we going to react uh, once the pandemic is here? Um, we, so all of those things come into take, we have to take into account as we plan. Um, the pandemic, we, we knew we would be better off if we implement the policies that we needed. We knew also that it was relatively easy for some folks. I think we the estimate is like 60% of folks who work in DC have jobs that they could easily go home and do it. I did it. I in fact have not been in my office uh, since more than a year now. Physically, I walked out of there, I went back on a Saturday just to make sure I got the things that I needed and that's been it. Um, but for a lot of folks, um, that's not been the case. And it's also, we, we've already talked about how we are highly segregated. So it's segregated by race, it's segregated by income and it's segregated by jobs and all of those things. Um, I, if I were to show you maps, there are several, there are neighborhoods in Southeast where up to 60% of folks who don't, don't have a car. And we know that folks also don't have, and the transportation options in that part of town are less than in the center of the city, let's say in Ward, Ward 1. And so folks in those areas, we deliberately uh, put the vaccine distribution sites in those areas to try to be responsive to that. However, what we knew, we did several surveys in uh, and we, we, in, we had a, a several folks, I think nearly 6,000 people answered the survey. So we have good quality data telling us what people were thinking about whether they were gonna take the vaccine or not. And what we were finding is that there were significant differences by race and ethnicity in terms of people's intent to take the vaccine. So some of what we were seeing when the vaccine got released, again, were not necessarily big surprises. 
we were seeing that amounts the Asian population, 93% said they were going to take it and only 6% said they would not. For the white population, for the black population, it was down to 60% and some 39, nearly 40% said they were not going to take it. For the Hispanic population, it was more in the 85% and for the um, white population, it was 95%, right? So some of that is also related to folks and their, their social context, whether they're, I know that I was sitting at home and I, obviously I work in public health, but you know, the, almost every day there was a press release, there was a, you know, so the folks who have the luxury, and I always point to myself and several others who can sit and watch and read the news and do all that stuff, kind of know bit by bit by bit what's happening and even about the vaccine. And so I think there's a lot of just, some of us are picking up this knowledge by osmosis and the rest who are, let's say you're driving a bus or you're doing some other kind of work where you don't have the luxury of keeping constantly in touch. And then when you get home. So I think there are a lot of things that have transpired first to inform that process then of course you know we had disinformation and all of those things that contributed to that and made it worse some of it deliberate some of it just lack of knowledge so i think so we started of course with putting the um the, the major kinds of places and we were you probably know this too we were severely limited in the number of vaccines that we were getting from the federal government when it first opened up the recommendations from the CDC also said that it's a good idea to start with the healthcare workforce. So even if I were to give you what was happening in the healthcare workforce, the numbers were not dissimilar to the ones that I just said by race and ethnicity. So we are also in a situation in the District of Columbia where our population of uh, around 700,000 more, 710,000 kind of doubles during the daytime. We're also the hub for healthcare in, in, in the region. And so we have a lot of folks who come in and work here. And so we, it was, it, it was part, of our, um, part of our strategy to actually have those folks take the vaccine. And then we did some negotiation with our partners around the DMV from Virginia and Maryland, and they gave us some vaccine. But there was also some tension, political tension between the federal government who undercounted and did not want to budge um, in that situation as to how much we had. So we started off in that situation where we have limited vaccine, we have people who have more knowledge than others, and we have a whole lot of folks who don't want to take it, and a whole lot of people who have the wherewithal to go get it when it was available. So we have had to be uh, quick on our feet to transition and evolve. So we transitioned and we evolved. So even though we put it in particular areas, if you think about it, if you were working in downtown DC and you, you can't get home or whatever your travel situation is, even, even if the vaccine is on your doorstep, if you don't have the kind of job where you have flexibility, where you can go when they say, come get the vaccine, you can't go at X time or run out the door just because it's available. So long answer to, all the things that we've, we've had to do, and we're now at a point where we are, um, you know, and I'll give you some further, but I'll let you go to the next question. Great, thank you so much. Well, you teed up the next question perfectly, um, which really focuses on some of the shifts that DC has made. So I know, you know, one thing that has been followed closely and, and actually got national coverage is just the shift in sort of the way the appointments um, system was, um, was rolled out and, um, you know, um, concerns at the beginning of it sort of being a free for all that um, that meant, like you said, the people who were at home and could refresh the screen and had internet and had a computer and weren't taking care um, about childcare help of several children at home and things like that. Um, you know, those were the people who were able to get on and, and get the appointments and we, mm -hmm. we those inequities as a result. Um, but DC's made a bunch of shifts um, over time in that process. Okay. Um, and also there's been a lot of attention recently to some, you know, some of the, the different partnerships um, and initiatives that have rolled out um, to try to promote greater equity in certain um, neighborhoods and wards um, in the vaccine process. I was wondering if you could talk about that. What have been some of the shifts um, and, and initiatives that have rolled out um, in order to promote equity? Um, and if you can talk about how DC has been 
um, and, and can be kind of leveraging partnerships. Um, right. Well, the, the, the first set of problems that we had, apart from the issue of limit, much greater demand than supply. So that was the first thing. Um, the second thing was uh, just trying to figure out and, and then putting things in a particular place and it's not working. We did learn some of that before we had the vaccine because even when we were trying to do um, when we were trying to do people doing tests, people could get tests anytime they wanted. They weren't necessarily using it, so we were building on some of that learning uh, through that. We had a lot of technology challenges too, right? So the technology challenges were severe, um, and and it made it worse because we knew that simply putting X number of vaccines aside, as well as the nature of the vaccines that we had at the beginning, you couldn't take it out to a mom and pop outlet because the vaccines had to be stored. And it was, it was not, you had to have a significant, you had to have fairly large distribution sites with the high level of refrigeration and all of those things to come. We had a lot of people at the beginning asking, can we help, can we help, can we help? But we had to say, your role needs to be more of encouraging people. So we had to be doing multiple things at the same time of trying to educate folks who said, well, I have, we had some folks who said, well, I have a lot of folks who come here to the farmer's market. And we're like, well, yeah, they're coming here to the farmer's market or whatever it was, uh, or to pick up groceries, but it's not enough of them to make the, make the cut, you know, to make it worth the while. And you have to, we, we also don't let any old person deliver vaccines. So you need to have a partnership with a healthcare provider. So those things became pretty complex. Um, the technology also was, it was a major issue. We've had several, I think it was Saturdays, we had to shift around the dates. We had to prioritize um, some zip codes above the others. And so more recently, what we did was to shift from everybody go out and grab a vaccine to folks actually registering in a central repository. And then what we started doing was distributing them. So even before we got to that, there were some relationships where the federal government was trying to drive vaccines to, um, to pharmacies and all of those kinds of things. So it was, it was very confusing and very complex. Um, at this point, what we have is 30 to 40 percent of our vaccines go to um, health care partners, so hospitals, FQHCs, and health centers. Another 30 to 40 percent, and I'm just saying that just generally, are in that new public vaccine distribution pool where people are registering and then we distribute them. And then 20 to 30 percent are in special initiatives. So the spe I'm going to talk about the special initiatives first. The special initiatives are the ones where we're trying to address the folks who probably would not get covered in the first two buckets, right? So they're the folks who are maybe elderly in public housing, stuck at home with no transportation. So we develop partnerships with the housing authority. We develop partnerships with all different kinds of folks to uniquely target particular groups that could not reach out to get to those others. Um, we, we did all kinds of different things. We tried and we tested different methods and models. Um, and then it's, now that I can, and, and we're still developing more and more of those as we go forward, even as, as things have changed literally today. And so for the vaccine pool, I think that's pretty interesting. I think one of the things that happened at the beginning, um, the mayor basically required that we had a, a pretty firm vaccine strategy, we had to do major investments in working with Google to update um, the initiative. The special initiatives included partnerships with One Medical to do um, school and child care. Kaiser Permanente did MPD and, and others, the housing authority, um, you know, et cetera. So those are the kinds of things that we did. In the uh, vaccine place, and I'm trying to get my data, it's hard to remember all of these things. Um, we had the, the way the, the, the vaccines are currently distributed based on need um, and in terms of the several zip codes that we are targeting. Um, what we're doing is right now is 20% of DC residents in priority zip codes who are 65 years and older, 20% of residents at any one time who are six, any zip code who are 65 years and older, 
20% who are in priority, priorities of those who are 18 to 64. And so that's what we're doing. By the time we got to the point where we had the central repository, I think within a few weeks, we had 144,000 folks who had registered. So now we're more in the mode of prioritizing. We put it into this, our first mode was 65 and over, uh, sorry, healthcare workers. Um, then we went to 65 and older. Then we went to folks with um, uh, prioritized conditions. And we are, as of today, we and, and following the government trend, now that we have a lot more vaccine available, we actually will be moving to anybody above 16 years and older who wants a vaccine starting in April 12th. We're not even having to wait until um, April 19th. And that is largely because we've given out 89% of our vaccine at any one time, and we have been doing a really good job. We've expanded so how we've, even though we couldn't do a whole lot of large vaccine sites that other places did, we, uh, we had a series of about four or five uh, high throughput uh, vaccine outlets that we developed. And that's really taken us a long way. At this point, I think we're at like 14% of district residents who are fully vaccinated and maybe uh, somewhat more of that who are at least have one vaccine. So we are on par, um, but we're still a little, with all of the different shifts that are happening, just to be, you know, candid, we're, we're, we've fallen back a bit. We were ahead of the curve at one point, um, but we've got, that we've done some, we've got some good compliments on the way we, despite the challenges that we've had, we've got a lot of kudos for being one of the, the best of, best in class in terms of our, our website and some of the things, the information that we've shared. And are you seeing some of the equity gaps in vaccination close as a result of some of these um, initiatives and partnerships? Well, yes, we have seen significant improvements in that now that we are prioritizing some zip codes, we're seeing the vaccine uptake to be a lot larger. One of our major challenges have been, and this is throughout the healthcare um, system, we don't always have good data. So as you start working with partners, you don't always, their reporting back has not been on par, so we are not always able to report. So that's one thing. We don't always have the race, ethnicity, and all of those other data pieces that we need. We also did not put up a barrier that said, if you are saying you have X condition, and I'm not saying people are being dis dishonest, but I'm saying, we have not been you know, kind of making those kinds of barriers where folks who may not have everything together. So we've been trying to be fairly um, fair. I don't want to call it lenient, but I think we've not been putting up barriers and turning people away. Um, and when vaccines have become available or if they haven't been used up at the end of the day, we're not preventing folks from, you know, just give it to somebody who happens to be there. But again, you hear a lot of stories of how that has either been a positive or a negative. Thank you. And um, I think just, I have one or two last questions and then we're gonna turn it over to the students. Um, so I was wondering if you could just look forward now for us. Um, what, are, what are sort of the immediate next steps um, for DC Health um, in terms of promoting equity at this point as you look forward? And also what, um, what lessons can we learn um, from the pandemic that will you know, sort of most help the city combat health inequity? Well, I think I, we at DC Health knew we had a problem, right? <laughs> a year before the pandemic. Uh, we actually had a health literacy plan or a campaign that we had planned that we wanted to roll out. <laughs> we never got there. What we've learned, I mean, and I'm not saying we had everything down, what we've learned beyond the, the three buckets that we had in our health literacy plan prior to the pandemic, we have now added a public health literacy as part of what there needs to be. Because even though we were focused uh, in turn of kind of turning the curve prior to the pandemic, um, as I told you before, we have you know 90 odd percent of folks, 95 percent, one of the highest rates in the country who have health insurance but we were not seeing the dividends from that um, before the pandemic. And I, I expect that we're, it won't be any better when we're done because we will have lost a lot of ground during the pandemic. So our original plan talked about health literacy, um, sorry, 
health insurance literacy, understanding your benefits, all of those things. People were still in the patterns of going to the emergency room rather than taking advantage of, of preventive health care. So we've got to do that and then some, because we now have to really think about what, which is what we've been doing. <laughs> and again, just getting the message out has been difficult, um, difficult for all kinds of reasons. It's not always that people can't get to all of the things that we see are barriers to health care or accessing health care. I think we also note as a barrier to accessing the information or the public health information for the pandemic, as well as the vaccine. So we've got to work on that as one of the first things. But I think the other things that we have to see, so we have to deal with issues of access to healthcare and healthcare quality, because we still have that structural and institutional racism that we talked about are still prevalent inside of, health, inside of the healthcare system. We have to deal with the social and structural determinants of health. I didn't emphasize that at the beginning. There has been a habit of only talking about social determinants of health. Um, and social determinants of health would say, um, and I'm glad the, uh, the kind of work when you're talking health justice and you're talking about housing, it's more than just, here's a small amount of money, go, buy, go get a house. But then after that benefit is gone, you're on your own. It has to be much more about the structural drivers that are not only creating, not only producing inequitable outcomes, but are continuously recreating the inequitable outcomes. So the folks who live east of the river, for example, we in our heads think that, well, housing is cheaper over there. So people who are on a more constrained income can live over there and enjoy a relatively good quality of life. What we do know, however, when you even, even at those lower incomes, sorry, at those lower housing prices, because their incomes are so low, they're still spending it more than everybody else as a proportion of their income on housing. And the quality of that housing that they're purchasing, even though they're not homeless and they have a, uh, you know, a roof over their heads, they're living in a poor quality environment frequently with a lot of none of the amenities that most of us assume are required for a good quality of life. And that includes not enough grocery stores, not high quality transportation. We talked about that before. So those are the kinds of things. So we've got to address access to healthcare, the social and structural determinants of health. So the structural determinants of health and the laws and the practices. So I call it, there is something called health in all policies, which I think I mentioned. So when we say health and all policies, that P is for policies, programs, practices, and laws. And so there is a diagram in the health equity report that talks about the importance of structural determinants of health. And if we don't change those laws and those practices, including the influence of structural institutional racism, we will continue to see these things self-perpetuate themselves over and over again. So we got to do that. But by and large, we don't have the opportunity to say, oh, we're going to work on education first, and then we're going to do something else. We really, there is enough work for all of those uh, nine key driver sectors to do the work in terms of thinking about the structural drivers of inequities where, where they live, learn, work, and play, as well as things like the housing equity report, which followed the health equity report's release. And it's talking about disaggregating and the the um, the uh, you know kind of the the housing low income housing that we have in some parts of the city. The more we do that, the less we are able to have um, investments by the private and other sectors to bring full service grocery stores to some parts of town. So the band aids that we keep investing in, like you know, giving people double box for, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with double box. We don't want people to die before the grocery store comes. But those are band-aids as opposed to deep investments in the structural, changing the structural dynamics, dynamics where people live, learn, work, and play. One of the things that we find, for example, is we have large, um, large uh, high schools, we're up to 50 they only have a 50% graduation rate. And I'm just kind of giving you the lie of the land. 
if it's a if there's supposed to be 200 kids or 400 kids in the class and we have we have schools that large and it's a 50 percent graduation rate it means that year after year after year we are letting kids leave school without a graduate uh, uh, a high school diploma and we know right off the bat that they're going to live five years shorter. It's not a, an automatic thing, but that's what we generally see. So those folks become the parents of tomorrow with low wage jobs and all of the other things. And so it keeps, keeps cycling through one to the next. So I think ultimately the recommendations at the end of the health tech report talks about the need for two main things, proactive multi-sector solutions, the, uh, need to drive meaningful transformational change and then we need to have equity informed collaborative actions that are cognizant of the historic and structural underpinnings of the policies practices and law that drive our, con our contemporary health outcomes so those are the things that we still have to work on informed by and in fact redoubling our efforts because of the pandemic and knowing that it it will be harder not easier. And some people have fallen, they were behind before, and now they've pro they're probably falling even further behind. Thank you so much, Dr. Arno. That was so insightful. And you you really painted a vivid um, picture for us of um, you know, what the families, you know, the systems that the families who are struggling the most in our city um, are stuck within and cycling through. And we're seeing that in, in our work, we're seeing the way that living in a food desert without a grocery store is impacting food insecurity. And it did before the pandemic and it's doing so um, even more so now. And, and we're seeing the effects of the lack of affordable housing um, in our city on health and, and housing insecurity. And the families, the several families we've worked with this, this year who've become homeless in the middle of the pandemic. And also the families whose health are suffering because they're living in those kind of horrible substandard housing conditions that, mm -hmm. that you described that are overrepresented east of the river um, and, and stuck at home during, <laughs> during a period of social distancing with conditions like mold and rodents and lead. Um, that, that are really amplifying those health effects. So I'm so glad you talked about those structural issues um, in such a vivid way. Thank you for, your, for that work. Um, I now wanna turn it over to Blair and the students um, who have some questions for you during our remaining. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Arno and Professor Cannon, thank you so much for your conversation today. I think this has been incredibly timely and insightful as we are now approaching the April 12th date when most people will be able to access the vaccine. And just kind of going off of that, um, what are some of the benchmarks, Dr. Arno, that you and your department have set for vaccine equity and herd immunity rates in DC? Well, I think we are going to continue with what we have been doing at yeah, those same 20% of this 20, we're, we're still going to do that. We're still going to prioritize the zip codes that we've been prioritizing. We have not set kind of formal benchmarks. We, we just, our goal is to get everybody vaccinated. We've started buddy systems to encourage people to, you know, take somebody, it's not, it's not quite like take them to the polls, but help folks out. So I think those are the main things. Our biggest um, concern is that folks stay on the sideline to the point where we get past where there is a lot of vaccine coming into the city and then they have not done what they needed to do. Um, in fact, because there was so much hesitancy, we probably moved forward faster through the, the different um, gate posts that we had planned for the vaccine because, for example, we still have folks who are healthcare workers or frontline workers who have not taken the vaccine. And I don't want to paint them as being vaccine hesitant because we, and I know there is some of it, but I think a lot of it is things like convenience. So we are about to roll out a new home vaccine program. And that's mostly for folks who really cannot get out, right? So they may have been on the list. And I think the further you go down, so in some respects, it's a good news, bad news story. Well, I don't I, I don't want to say it's a bad news story because now we have better control over nobody can rush in and take all the vaccines. So the, the process that we've been doing in, in prioritizing different groups going forward is really important. 
Um, but I think those are those are the primary things that we're going to be doing. We've learned a lot um, through this process. As I, I talked about, um, there is also we're going to be doing more major investments in doing more of the work that we've been doing in terms of building partnerships. Um, and as I mentioned, doing a lot more in the vein of health literacy. If we if we get the we're 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 wanting to apply for a grant, we're doing some work on that because we really think that we should leverage um, folks' interest in, in health and health literacy, first started with the vaccine and the vaccine distribution, because we're not out of the woods, because we, we still have to do that education piece about, yes, you're vaccinated, but we still need you to not be running around the city. We still need to wear masks. We still need to kind of do our social distancing for some time because of the issues of the new variants, et cetera. So there's a lot of work that still has to happen. We still need to keep, keep those things front and center. So we're moving into phase two, um, in fact, on May the 12th, which means that there are gonna be a lot more things opening up. But with that, with that freedom comes more responsibility. And I think that's going to be another set of challenges that we'll have to face. We also have to deal with the issue of when we get to the issue of kids, how, you know, where is, where is that? We're going to have issues in terms of learning more. In fact, we have a new survey. I gave you the data um, starting or talking about um, vaccine hesitancy. We've seen it grow across most of the country. Uh, we're doing another set of survey work to see where we were. So we, were, we are hoping to see a lot better outcomes um, going forward. Thank you. And I'm now going to turn it over to Eric Taylor, who I believe has a question. Uh, good evening, Dr. Arno. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, it seems uh, that the pandemic is really one of those memorable chapters in American history where uh, a lot of people recognize that we can never repeat this crisis again. And I think of, you know, when I was growing up, the biggest crisis of our time was 9-11. And it seems as if after 9-11, the American government took very proactive, deep steps to avoid that happening. And I think many people today have no fear in going on an airplane. You think the American government is demonstrating the same level of urgency in terms of the pandemic. And I know a lot of people in my generation are, are sitting here wondering, you know, will a, will a pandemic like this ever happen again? Because we don't want to see something, you know, like this happen again ever in our lifetime, right? Mm -hmm. you, look, you know, as life returns to normal and people go back to their everyday lives and, you know, you think about seven, eight years from now, will mm -hmm. that same urgency be at the forefront of our, of our government? Or, you know, do you think we're going to have a long lasting just fear in the back of our mind that at any moment, you know, a pandemic can break out and, you know, we go back to what we're dealing with right now. So what is your, I guess it's more of a, you know, what is your uh, hope or optimism in the future in terms of sustaining you know, proactive response to this issue? Well, I think I have a mixture of a healthy respect. I think that that's what I think hopefully the pandemic will build for all of us, a healthy respect for how important, not just knowledge about health, but our individual and collective responsibility, I think is what is really important. And uh, we saw when that was lacking, what happened? We're seeing people respond. We've seen different kinds of responses all over the country and what that has, what that has meant for all of us. Um, so I think, I, th I hope if nothing else, everybody appreciates and has a healthy respect for the importance of public health. And that's why I said, we did not have public health in our health literacy line, line items of the campaign we were gonna build. We now have it. And I'm not saying, you know, it's not that we, we you know, we, we are public health practitioners, but I don't think we fully appreciate it until now how important all of us are and all of us buying in. When we started off in the district, and I think the district has actually done better than a lot of places, even though overall, and I'm, I'm not saying I'm not negating the fact that a lot of folks have suffered, but we've actually held up a lot better than a lot of places, and there's been less you know, we haven't had a lot of folks kind of, you know, angry in the street or in a store or wherever. People have mostly complied. So DC Health, as I know the mayor's office has said repeatedly that we've appreciated the cooperation of district residents, but how do we keep that up? 
how can we use this? And so one of the things we're planning to do, we, we were supposed to have a health equity summit last summer, but that couldn't happen. We're planning to have one this summer. We're hoping to leverage the, the new insight that has come out of not only the work from the pandemic, from the health equity work, but from the pandemic. So the other work that I'm doing right now is looking at the impact of COVID, not just simply to measure the poor outcomes, but more to, to frame up what the opportunities are. So I like your question, what the opportunities are for us to utilize this policy window. I mean, I think we have to think about that. If we're in a policy window that has demonstrated I know we, we say it, we've been saying it, we're all in this together, but you know, we, all of us who were, had the luxury of staying at home were, were afforded that luxury because there were a lot of people who were frontline workers that we suddenly were calling all kinds of fancy names that we did not appreciate them before. You know, things like we maybe not like Amazon, but you know, those are the folks who were delivering, taking the trash out, all of those things. So. What is the value of their work? How do we protect them? And what is our collective responsibility to make those things happen? So I think we need to leverage that healthy respect for the pandemic and to make sure and to learn that it doesn't have and to learn collectively and that it doesn't happen again. And I believe we have just one more um, quick question, either for you, Dr. Arno, or for Professor Cannon. I think this would apply for both of you. But what are some of the steps that law students can take to promote healthcare justice and health equity? I'll let you go, Professor Cannon. <laughs> okay, and I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, your closing thoughts, uh -huh. Dr. Arno. Um, but but I would say come get involved, um, you know, with our work at the Health Justice Alliance. Um, it's really exciting when Dr. Arno uses words like collaborative and multi-sector um, because you can hear as she talks about health that she really has a holistic vision for what it means to have health and well-being um, in our city and and nationally, um, and that is so important to closing those gaps. And so. It's really exciting that we have this opportunity at a place like Georgetown to come together across sectors to have medical students and law students learning about these issues, working side by side, um, thinking about these problems holistically um, and thinking about the solutions holistically, thinking about how we can bring the best of our various disciplines and approaches together, um, how we can let the communities we serve lead us um, and, and you know um, tell us how we as lawyers can um, you know, support um, the things that they want for and deserve for themselves. Um, and, you know, all of you are going to be, you know, the, the next leaders in law and policy <laughs> um, in our country and, and some of you in our city. And so, um, you know, it's so great that you have an opportunity to think deeply while still in law school about these issues um, and to get a chance to work on them. So, you know, you, you can sign up for our law clinic and we're in the middle of the clinic enrollment period right now. If you wanna, um, you know, kind of get out of the ivory tower in DC and, and work in some of the 51 statistical neighborhoods that Dr. Arno described um, and get to know um, people who live in those communities and collaborate across sectors. We would love to have you. Um, we take two L's and three L's. Um, and I'm happy to talk to any of you offline about the clinic. We also have a, a Capitol Hill Advocacy Day um, where um, law and med students are collaborating, looking at bills that are pending in Congress around issues of health justice um, and, and the intersection of social justice and health. And there are so many. Um, our students are just learning right now about the Momnibus bill, which is a slate of bills um, to reduce uh, maternal and infant health disparities, which is another huge problem in DC, um, but also nationally. And so there are opportunities to go up on the Hill and advocate um, together um, for legislation that can um, you know, reduce some of these gaps um, through the health justice Alliance. And then just lastly, I'll mention that we just launched um, two um, additional projects um, up at um, 
at MedStar Washington Hospital Center. One is the perinatal law project, which is specifically looking at um, maternal and infant health disparities in DC through the um, Safe Mom, Safe Babies program. Um, but seeing that there's an opportunity for law students um, and attorneys up there to actually advocate around some of these social and structural um, determinants of health for moms and babies. Um, and then the second program is um, the Cancer Law Project, which is working with the um, Lombardi Cancer Center and Cancer Law Institute, um, looking at social determinants that affect that population. So there's opportunities for you guys to really get involved um, in these issues while you're still in law school um, and after you graduate. And so, um, you know, we can connect you if you have certain interest areas that you wanna explore further. Well, I, I couldn't have done it better than you are there. Uh, my, I haven't said this yet. One of the things, one of my favorite sayings is health equity is everybody's work. And I mean that sincerely. So it's not only a 9P driver thing. Um, in the summer, I, I, well, I've done it for mel multiple years. I did it in Louisville. We have something called a Healing Futures Fellowship. And we actually um, engage young people. So high school, there's a high school fellowship. Um, for rising sophomores, juniors, and seniors. And we try to select them from all across the city, total of 25. We don't say that you have to be a healthcare pra practitioner. In fact, we are looking for kids who want to do all different kinds of work. It doesn't matter what you wanna do. And we have a few who've gone to law school since. Um, but the idea is that they need to have a foundation in whatever your work is. And I always say, whether you're a student, a parent, Whatever you're doing in the district, you're a voter. If you're a voter, you have some say in the laws and policies in the city. If you, whatever your job is, you, I want to make, I want you to be on my team and you are looking at all of the things that you can do as a citizen in your job, whatever your job is to figure out how we promote health equity. Because remember what I said, it's a health in all policies, health in all paradigms policies, programs, and practices. So there's a lot of work. Uh, happy that you're gonna be joining me in that work. Um, I always like to tell everybody that you're now on my team. So welcome to being on the health equity team in the District of Columbia and for the rest of your life. So it should be a life, lifelong learning experience as well, wherever you go and whatever you do. Well, thank you to Dr. Arno and thank you to Professor Cannon for taking time out of your incredibly busy schedules, doing incredibly busy work or incredibly important work to talk to Georgetown students today. Um, I know that this was incredibly insightful for a lot of our students. So thank you so much. You're, you're most welcome. Um, if any of you have not seen the Health Equity Report, I will send a, the link to Shannon in, and so she can, so there's a long version and a short version. Um, and hopefully within the next several months, there will be an update. Uh, we're gonna do a preliminary update and then next year we're gonna do a full update. But thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you also to Blair and Shannon um, and, and the ACLU team for your wonderful work organizing and for having just the brilliant idea to invite Dr. Arno to come um, talk with our students. And Dr. Arno, thank you for um, warmly welcoming us onto your team. Okay. Ma now the work begins. <laughs> Thank you All so right. much. Good night, Good night, everyone. Good night.